welcome to uh, this evening's um, John Coffin Memorial Distinguished Irish Studies Lecture uh, of 2017. Um, in a moment, it will be my great privilege and pleasure to introduce uh, this evening's speaker, Yvonne Toland. Um, but before that, I just want to say a few words about uh, the John Coffin Memorial Lecture. Uh, the institutes of the School of Advanced Study host John Coffin Memorial events on behalf of the University of London in fulfilment of gift by Mr. Coffin's son, Arthur Charles, who before the Second World War had close connections with the University of London. I quote now from all that is preserved of him in the institutional memory. Mr. Coffin was concerned that in the growing intensity of specialization in modern times, we should not lose sight of music, the arts, and what he termed the cultural aspects of education, and not, not the least of good general teaching on a sound religious basis. In addition to a part of the bequest devoted to lectures in Christian ethics, history, literature, and science, other parts are earmarked for literary readings of prose and poetry, chamber concerts or recitals, and for the publication of reports by the Institute of Education. Mr. Coffin further states in his will that he desired each event to be announced as part of the John Coffin Memorial, and it therefore appears likely that the bequest is in memory of his father. Beyond this little is known of either John or Arthur Coffin, and it is often said of John Coffin that he is a man mysteriously famous or famously mysterious. <laughs> Recent research has however revealed that John Coffin was a journeyman blacksmith residing in Dorchester. When his son Arthur Charles was born in March 1868, his wife, Mary Ann, nay Willis, made her mark on his birth certificate, i.e. she had no writing literacy. Arthur Charles became an exter external student of the University of London graduating with a pass degree in the arts in 1889 by private study, receiving some tuition at the former St. John's College of Battersea. He retired as Inspector of Education at Dorset and died aged 88 in July 1956, leaving his residual estate £27,000 at the University in 1957. <coughs> These newly established facts exemplify the founding mission of the University of London to widen access to tertiary education as far as possible. Since its foundation in 1994, the School of Advanced Study has opened up coffin readings, recitals, and lectures, and the last few years have seen a widening of the subject range to include the history of ideas, paleontology, Irish studies, um, paleography, and the history of the book. This year has seen a further extension often funding to new subject areas within the school, such as post-colonial studies, human rights, and public engagement in the humanities. Uh, this evening's lecture is um, generously supported, therefore, by the John Coffin Memorial Trust, but also is, comes as really the uh, end point and um, celebration of a year's Irish studies seminars. Uh, which is hosted by myself, Ben Levitas, uh, Lauren Arrington, Roy Foster, uh, Simon Prince, and Maggie Skull, my colleagues who help run um, the seminar. And um, in addition to this, we also have, uh, as is custom now, a wine reception hosted by the Irish Embassy, uh, which we'll all enjoy later. Uh, it's become something of a tradition that the embassy hosts this reception for the distinguished lecture every year, and their but their generosity is anything but routine. And I'd like to thank them again for their continued support. Our speaker this evening, Ivan Gold, is a writer of profound importance, not just in the Irish pantheon of poets, but in world literature. Her status is one of historical significance to be addressed in the same breath as Yeats and Heaney, as a poetic and, and critical arbiter of cultural change. 
One of those, Shelley, Shelley called the unacknowledged legislators. A landmark collection, Outside History, was published in 1990 and immediately was resonant when Mary Robinson was elected President of Ireland in that year. Mary Robinson chose to quote Ivan in her inaugural address, calling attention to the importance of the symbolic in public discourse and her intention to deploy that symbolism drawing on outside history and reaching for the singers, the poem that would open Ivan's next collection in a time of violence to give form to her point. Mary Robinson said, I want women who have felt themselves outside history to be written back into history. In the words of Ivan Boland, finding a voice where they have found a vision. In nearly 20 books of poetry and prose over the last half century, the potency and intensity of Van Boland's voice and vision has offered Ireland and the world roots between the inside and outside of history, signaling to the absent and excluded paths back to presence. It is fitting to remember that Ivan's first collection, which came out in 1967, was titled in the signature of bold intent, New Territory. In her most recent work of critical reflection, a journey, between, a journey with two maps becoming a woman poet, which won the 2012 Penn Award for Creative Nonfiction, Ivan revisits her young self as a Trinity College graduate looking up at the windows of Marion Square with an early enthusiasm for one of their long gone occupants. Jane Francesca Agnes, otherwise Speranza, editor and nationalist propaganda poet for the nation, as well as being the mother of Oscar Wilde. Speranza, Boland reflects, was restrained by a prescriptive language or rhetoric of nationality. She observes, a national tradition is a willful editor. It's one of those phrases that reminds us that her critical cultural acuity matches her powers of poetic observation and lyrical command, as well as making us envious of her students and colleagues at Stanford University, where Ivan has been Professor of Humanities and Director of the Creative Writing Program since 1996. Ivan Boland's poetry is full of unshrinking challenges to that editor opening the pages of the National Anthology to a feminist challenge. In 1980, she co-founded the Irish feminist press, Arlen House, and has recently become editor of Poetry Island Review, hopefully becoming a willful editor for others to challenge again. They will do so inevitably. In the light of her influence, hers is a poetry of witness giving form to women's lives, plotting the emergence from domestic interior to a landscape of historical signification, disrupting that landscape as it reshapes it, disturbing its mythic completeness with concrete encounters. What she has described as life's dailiness, we just talk about dailiness again outside. There is a favorite image of mine bear my uh, indulgence here. Uh, from the title poem of her sequence, Object Lessons, that describes this power. It was yours, she begins. It was yours, your coffee mug, black, with a hunting scene on the side. Cruel theatre as the kettle poured. Together we unpacked it in the new house. The breathtaking concision of this image, the cup, the reproduction of received iconography in domestic spaces, the incarnation of social power in intimate actions, cruel theater as the cattle poor, just gonna keep saying it over and over, to unpack it over and over. Um, that reveals again the power of the writer construing the local, in this case, a woman's mother's view of the Dublin suburbs in all its complex ramifications. This is what placed Boland's work in a lineage of Plath, Elizabeth Bishop, 
Adrienne Rich, as well as with her Irish contemporaries. It's a tribute to her power that she belongs with each. Her most recent collection, A Woman Without a Country, is both a critique of nation and a testament to change observed from Dundrum, to which she returns between Stanford semesters. Encountering her maternal grandmother as someone for whom the story of Irish history was not her history, Boland meets again a country that continues to adjust, answering, however hesitantly, her calling attention to lived lives. And I should mention just now before I forget that there are uh, copies of books by Yvan and about Yvan, in fact, a new uh, edition of collected essays by Star Studded Galaxy of her contemporaries. Uh, Yvan Bold Inside History book is on sale. And you can avail yourself of that during the um, drinks after. Um, as the daughter of a diplomat father, whose childhood departed Dublin to spend the early 1950s in London, what she calls in an early poem, the city of fogs and strange consonants, and later New York before returning to Ireland as a teenager, Ivan Lauren's work has embraced the sensibility of the outside. But she is also the daughter of her mother, a painter, with an eye for that which designates belonging. Her work stands as a, as a threshold, holding doors open between identities, between the descriptors, Irish, woman, poet, the complexities of being, of being all three. So, she always carries with her at least two maps, and is with us this evening to talk about what she has titled The Shifting Ground, Ireland, Irish Poetry in a Time of Change. In this era of hardening borders, there is no one, I think, better equipped to speak to us on that subject. And I'd like to welcome her. Thank you. Just one thing about thanking Ben for such a kind introduction, and thank Ben and his colleagues for coordinating this lecture, and uh, also to thank the Coffin Trust for their commitment to it. The, the, the lecture is indeed called Irish Poetry in a, in, a, in a Time of Change, Shifting Ground, but you'll see that my sense of what's shifting is different. Um, I'm glad to, to get the chance to talk about some things which for a very long time have been with me and in my mind and maybe sometimes don't feel, uh, even in the bracing arguments we've had at times in Ireland, that enough focus has been added. So I'll begin by telling you just one sort of small quirky thing. For years I, I have kept with me a, a passage about poets and poetry and it, it comes from a book I'm not sure people read as much now. It's called The Hidden Ireland, and it was published in Ireland in, I think it was 24, maybe early 25. And it was written by the Irish writer and the activist Daniel Corkery, a very contentious man. The passage he writes in this book is about the 18th century poets, some of them not well known, some of them very well known, um, but they were the poets of the Irish language and they stood on the threshold in the 18th century of just historic catastrophe. And they were also poor men and their language was under threat and would be destroyed. And here is the passage from the Hidden Ireland that I've always kept with me and which in some ways I think of as exemplary. He says, in reading these poets, we have to keep in mind first that the nature of their poetry depends on the district in which it was written. If it was in Munster, it's literary in its nature. If it was in Ulster or Connacht, it has the simple directness of folk song. But we also have to remember and not forget that these poets were simple men, that they lived as peasants in rural surroundings, that some of them probably never ever saw a city. And not only this, but they were all poor men. Uh, very often sore troubled where and how they would find shelter or clothing or food at the end of a day's tramping. 
Their native culture is ancient, harking back to pre-Renaissance standards, but there is no inflow of books for them from outside to impregnate that culture with new thoughts. Their language is dying. Around them is the drip, drip of callous decay. Famine overtakes famine, or the people are cleared from the land to make room for bullocks. The rocks and hidden mountain clefts are the only altars that are left to them, and teaching is a felony. Not to excuse, but to explain them, are these facts mentioned by me. For their poetry, though doubtless it is the poorest chapter in the book of Irish literature, is in itself no poor thing that needs excuse. It is contrary-wise a rich thing, a marvelous inheritance, bright with music, flushed with color, and deep with human feeling. And to see it against the dark world that threw it up is to be astonished, if not dazzled. As I, I said, I've kept those words of cookeries with me for a very long time. And I've often referred to them, often spoken them to others, and spoken them to myself for two reasons. The first is just the obvious eloquence of that passage and indeed of that. It's a deeply democratic view of the poet's identity. Uh, Cokery was an advocate for that, but not an advocate for many other things in Ireland at the time. His passionate advocacy of an Irish Ireland, his argument with the idea of a canonical Irish revival, his ferocious opposition to William Yeats, offers a fascinating glimpse into the struggle for the soul of the Irish literary imagination at the start of the 20th century, a struggle largely erased for us now and unfortunately forgotten. But the second reason the passage from the Hidden Ireland stayed with me, and the reason it applies to this lecture, which is called Shifting Ground, is to do with Cochrane's attitude to the past. Cochrane was an opponent, as I've said, of the revival, he deplored the ideas of Yeats and Lady Gregory, believing they were offering foreign models to native writers. I, of course, don't think he was right, and I think some of the books are extremist. But he said something we have to listen to. He said, though we may think of that literature of the revival as a homogeneous thing, he wrote, we cannot think of it and will never think of it as an indigenous thing. And yet, Corkery found something I couldn't find, and which the other writers I mentioned, there are just a, a few of them this evening, did, didn't find. He found a usable past. These monster poets he mentions, these poets from elsewhere, may have been destroyed by history, but they lived in his mind. These countrymen were walking through the darkness of their history, and the threat to their language constituted a viable alternate tradition for him. He could describe them and invent them and commend them. They belonged to his imagination, and in turn, they nourished it. So the lecture I, tonight is called Shifting Ground, but inside that title are complicated and elusive paradigms we have to look for when we think how Irish poetry and Irish social change have intersected with each other. And it isn't easy to track the connection, and in some ways, it's also perilous to do it. For all his angers and all his resistances, Corkery inhabited a stable world in his convictions. He bestrode classic Ireland of the opening decades of the 20th century, where intellectual passion was based on certainty and never on doubt. The ground didn't shift under him. And maybe that seemed like an advantage to him. But often now, when I look back on Irish poetry and try to think of the conversation we're now in, and try to think, of course, uh, as time goes on, and I've written what I've written, and try to look into the future, it seems to me that Irish poets have recorded change and the Irish experience as well, but maybe better when they actually don't find a usable past. The shifting ground that happens in a nation forces a disjunction between past and present. Poets may not be makers of social change, and they shouldn't be, 
but both they and their readers can often feel the tremor of that change in the words they put on a page before the actions and alterations that even happened outside, and that's what I want to talk about. Having said that, this lecture, of course, is neither theoretical nor scholarly. It's just a series of impressions gathered by me as a poet and a reader. I intend to take just a very few poems this evening and hold them up to the light a little bit and to look, if I can, at that fleeting sense of connection and disconnection that came out of considering a poem and a society and change in the same frame. Uh, and I'll choose poems and poets, as I said, very few, who didn't find that the Irish past was a confirming space or an ordained inheritance. And I want to say that as a young poet or now, I have never been com comfortable with the canonical view that a poetic tradition is a continuity. It very rarely is. It's usually a series of fertile disruptions. Um, and so when a poet engages the past, by which I mean the poetic tradition, it has everything to do that engagement with whether they can add their name to it, uh, whether their experience has been inscribed in it or could be inscribed in it. The American poet Adrian Rich finishes that poem of hers, which is very powerful, called Diving into the Wreck, by pointing to, in her words, in the last line, that, to quote her words, a book of myths in which our names do not appear. We think of Irish poetry sometimes as an inclusive and creative shelter, but there were poets who didn't find it that shelter. And looked at in a different way, I do believe that the migrancy of certain Irish poets between past and present, between poems and tradition, had rich and important results in creating new spaces and in making new perspectives. Which allows me to add that when we look at those poems, we see certain formal energies as well as cultural ones. So where do we start? Sometimes the relation between change and poetry is not so visible, not so clearly seen. It can be encoded in the actual practice of a poet. And then you have to look carefully to for it. In that sense, I've always been extremely interested by a small portrait, not at all unknown to distinguished Yeats scholars, but it was provided by William Gates in his autobiographies long before any categories were in existence or being talked about. I've always been fascinated by this little passage from autobiographies. This is what he said. Someone at the Young Ireland Society gave me a newspaper so I could read some article or letter. And I began idly reading verses describing the shore of Ireland as seen by a returning and dying emigrant. My eyes filled with tears, and I, yet I knew that those verses were badly written vague, abstract words such as one finds in the newspaper. I looked at the end and I saw the name of some political exile who had died just a few days after his return to Ireland. But they moved me because they contained the actual thoughts of a man at a passionate moment of life. And when I met my father, I was full of the discovery. We should write, I said, out of our own thoughts in as nearly as possible the language we thought them in as though in a letter to an intimate friend. We shouldn't disguise them in any way, for our lives give them force as the lives of people in plays give force to their words. Personal utterance, which had almost ceased in English literature, could be as fine an escape from rhetoric and abstraction as drama itself. And my father was indignant. He was almost violent, and he wouldn't hear of, of nothing but drama. Personal utterance, he said, was only egotism. I knew it wasn't, but I didn't know how to explain the difference. I tried from then on to write out of my emotions exactly as they came to me in my life, not changing them to make them more beautiful. Yeats's words there uh, are, are written at one of the most endearing moments of his early emergence as a poet. And they, they are part of his own emerging aesthetic. But those phrases, despite the fact that he puts them down or he had that experience then, they help to anticipate the changes of a whole generation and an era of history as well. 
in order to be the public poet he would become, he required to have the passionate subjectivity that he instinctively moved towards in that bad poem. And it was necessary to him to stand in his poems and speak of and from his moment with that passion and subjectivity. In his own time, that was radical and it was communal. Yeats will turn up again in this lecture, unfortunately, when he was neither. Uh, but in this comment, he is both. Yeats knew that the ground was shifting. He knew it, of course. He talks about ways, these are his words, quote, to plot and scheme how one might seal with the right image the soft wax before it began to harden. And the art of his time, of course, with its multiple movements forward in language, contention, armed resistance, was soft wax. That mapped, uh, that, uh, and that moment mapped itself onto his mind. But where to begin with talking about change in a more sort of contemporary moment? Let me begin, of course, with Patrick Kavanagh. Kavanagh was, I'm sure many of you know, born in the border county of Monaghan in the townland of Inneskeen in 1904. He was a countryman. He described his father as, quote, a shoemaker, a small farmer, a hob doctor, and a ditto lawyer. The farm was less than 40 acres, and yet despite those hard-pressed times and the huge lack of money, uh, Kavanagh kept a passionate attachment to that birthplace. There are several fields I long to see again, he wrote later. All his life, the best of his poetry and his prose would evoke the ditches and the crossroads and the frosty distances and remembered visions of that birthplace in Monaghan. He was an unswerving critic as was Daniel Corkery of the Irish Revival. And I listened to him a little bit more than I listened to Corkery. I think Corkery in some ways was, was embittered by what he saw in the Revival. But I think Canada was a sharp critic. He, he said, it's usually taken for granted, he wrote in an article, that there was a great literary renaissance in Ireland within the last 50 years. How little of all that writing was of the slightest merit. Um, it, it's it's a, a quirky comment, but anyway, he came to Dublin in 1939. He lived there, and he was a very reluctant city dweller. He wrote and published poetry, and meant much of it was an implicit critique of the nationalism and idealism of the revival. One of his ambitious poems was *The Great Hunger*, published in the British magazine *Horizon* in 1942, brought out uh, as a cooler press con. Um, the sort of pamphlet by Frank O'Connor, it was a scolding anti-pastoral, a testament of con confinement and sexuality and pain. And it does remain his best known poem. These are his own words about his career. He said, a man I'm thinking of myself innocently dabbles in words and rhymes and finds that it is his life. Throughout the 40s and the 50s, his poems grew shorter and more visionary and more dissident. And the early social comment was burned away by poems of real private displacement. Quote, had I struck to the tragic thing in the great hunger, he once said, I would have found many powerful friends. And once again, I think he's right. But in those remarks, he shows his intention of resisting a preordained role that he suspected the revival was going to offer him. Feeling maybe, and rightly again, I think, that he was being screen tested by the revival to become a laureate of tragic rusticity, and he wasn't going to do that. A public poet confirming the Irish pastoral by dissenting from it, that's what they wanted. But in this poem, Epic, which is later, it's come, it's 1949 to 50, an encoded critique of his time is present. His poem, Epic, juxtaposes the life on the land in Monaghan with the 1939 uh, events of the Munich Accord, Epic. I have lived in important places, times when great events were decided. Who owned that half a root of rock, a no man's land, surrounded by our pitchfork armed claims? I heard the Duffy shouting, damn your soul, and old McCabe, stripped to the waist, seen step the plot to find blue cast steel. Here is the march along these iron stones. 
That was the year of the Munich bomber, which was more important. I inclined to lose my faith in Ballyrush and Gorchini, till Homer's ghost came whispering to my mind. He said, I may be Iliad from such a local row. Gods make their own importance. The poise and the satire of that summit and the subversive juxtaposition of a private quarrel with a seismic historic event do show Kavanagh's uh, artistry. He was uniquely equipped with his very clean syntax and his sharp place contrasting of talky lines with oracular ones to create a rare vernacular space. But the poem shows something else as well. It shows, I think, a place where the ground not only shifted in Irish poetry, it almost broke apart. And this is why I think that. Kavanagh published Epic in the Bell magazine in 1951 when it was under the editorship of Pather O'Donnell. That year in Ireland was a year of stasis in many ways, and it was full of maverick events that really can't be fitted together. Ernest Morton won the Nobel from physics out of Trinity, the amphitheater burned to the ground, and Samuel Beckett published Malloy, but in French. And none of those are going to contextualize Patrick Cavanagh's epic. To get a real context for that poem, we have to go back 13 years. The British scholar John Storworthy tells us in an article in the Review of English Studies in 1966 that the first draft of one of Yeats's final poems under Ben Bolvan was made ready in August of 1938. It was completed over the next few months. On January the 26th, 1939, he gave the poem to his wife with the final corrections noted on it. He died two days later, on the 28th of January, 1939, at 2 p.m. And in the final part of the poem, under Van Holden, he wrote these well-known lines. Irish poets, learn your trade, sing whatever is well made, scorn the sword, now growing up, all out of shape from toe to top. They're unremembering hearts and heads, baseborn products of base beds. Sing the peasantry and then hard riding country gentlemen, the holiness of monks and after porter drinkers, randy laughter. Sing the lords and ladies gay that were beaten into the clay through seven heroic centuries. Cast your mind on other days that we in coming days may be still the indomitable Irish. How are we to read the relation between these two poems, under Ben Balban and Epic, and we ought to read that relation. In the context of shifting ground, that's the way I think to go. I think we should read it as a testament, that relation, to one of the chief sources of what can shift and one of the chief errors of the Irish revival. The revival, for all its many strengths, overlooked something and it's an oversight that I recognize and that I can see in this relation. I belonged to a generation in which women poets went from being the objects of the Irish poem to being its authors. It was a disruptive transit, but it wasn't an original one. Kavanagh is the previous compelling model for that transit. And this is what really is happening here uh, in, in this relation between the poems. Looking at the end of Under Ben Balban, these lines about singing the peasantry, which I and every other Irish poet I've ever known look at with the greatest distaste. Uh, it's obvious not just that Kavanagh's name isn't written there. Um, what's written is a stage instruction uh, from the Irish Revival and, uh, you know, a, a stage direction about how to be an Irish poet, uh, sorry, an Irish peasant. Uh, and, and the journey that was made in these lines from Ben Balban to Epic uh, includes an arduous and important imaginative transit of one poet 
Patrick Kavanagh subverting everything from Irish history to the sonnet form with his authorship. But it also encodes the journey of a society which was happening but slowly, of an Irish people who could not and would not see themselves anymore in the mirror of the hierarchy William Mays proposes. Kavanagh, who could not find his name uttered by his precursors, like William Yeats, had to write a new name in a new poetry. In the process, I think, a fresher, more tense, more interesting poem emerges, poised somewhere between the public poem and the private statement, and I think Epic makes a very original alloy of those two things, which Irish poetry was faltering with since the 19th century. The political poems of the 19th century in Ireland are all public poems. But here, Kavanagh leverages the, the public poem into a political cast with private experiences. The, the relation between those two things brings me back to something which I have thought for a very long time and said. That there were two words, really, in my view, that haunted Irish poetry when I was young, at least as I saw them. And, and that, of course, is a deliberate generalization. But I did come to believe that two pivotal, challenging words for an Irish poet, and indeed for many other poets, were two pronouns, I and we. These were the words which were tested and retested in the Irish poetic tradition by violence and history, by heroic poetry and political verse. All the way from Speranza to Yeats, these were the poetic pronouns which tracked a century and a country and a poetry through its ordeals and its violations. And those were the words which were the most reliable markers uh, of new developments in both Irish poetry and Irish poems, pretty well from, I would say, uh, 1820 to 1920. But they were not stable words. They did not prove to be in any, any community, neither in themselves nor in their relations to each other. To put it simply, by the time I began writing, one had already strengthened and one had long ago begun to disintegrate. The word which showed most signs of distress was certainly not the I. That was a controversial quote, uh, uh, pronoun still is, of course, to use an eye in poetry is often attacked as marking out autobiography and self-indulgence as a legitimate viewpoint. But poets like myself who adhere to that, uh, many poets like myself, were targets of that critique. But there was nevertheless something solid, inevitable about the eye, especially in a country which valued the personal lyric. There was a feeling it had come through the fire. But that was not so with the, the next proton, now, which was we. It was in deep trouble and eroding by the time I began to write. Ireland was fragmented and tense with division and rubbed raw by faction, and what poet could use we confidently in those uh, circumstances. With time and uncertainty, whole worlds on which that e, we once depended were just vanishing from view. Constituencies were gone, and among those constituencies was a nation state rallied by rhetoric as the Ireland of the 19th century had been. I'm well aware that those are abstract comments, so let me give you an example of them, which I think is really the example of what happened to the word we in, in the early middle uh, parts of the 20th century. I once interviewed uh, Stephen Spender for Irish Radio, and uh, he told this story, which is a valuable story, and he told it in many other places as well. Um, W.H. Auden was in many ways the public laureate of the 1930s, an extraordinarily prescient, uh, powerful presence, writing about a collective malaise and in many ways a collective nightmare. A really beautiful, interesting poet. Then he came to 37, like everybody else, he went to Spain. And I know the small pamphlet he brought out of Spain, and I know the poem. The poem was suppressed by him, uh, which he did with a number of his poems. But the poem was written at that moment of collective, of both outrage and conversation, 
And the last lines of the poems encoded the Marxist argument of the moment that in some ways history was an unstoppable force. The, the last lines, I think, line and a half are, history to the defeated may say, alas, but cannot help or pardon. So this idea that, that um, history was an onrushing force and that people had to stand out of its way, it was the common currency of that time. I think Spain is, is a good poem. It is a, not that it's ideological, not that it's Marxist, it's just, like many such poems, very didactic. But it's also very interesting. Spender told a story that in 1939, Odin came to see him, because Odin was going to go, as we know, to the United States. And Odin saw that he had propped up the chapel of Spain on, on his mouthpiece. And he walked over to it, and he picked it up and went to the last lines, history to the defeated, struck them out with his pen, and wrote in the margin, this is a lie. And that is what you do not want to have with the word we. You do not want to take a pronoun which once in the 19th century could bring together communities right from the representation of communal feeling, and write a poem, even as Odin did, in which the intense fracture of that pronoun will not and cannot be bandaged by ideological, didactic, or political statement. And so the I and the we that was really happening uh, around me when I was young was um, a, a very important to me as a signifier of some kind. Um, and as that we became very hard to, for the Irish poet to get hold of, um, it, it, something did shift, and, but you had to watch for that. And uh, I was reviewing for the Irish Times at that time, which I did a, a lot. Um, and it brings me to my second choice of the poet, who is John Hewitt. Um, Hewitt was born in Belfast in 1907, three years later. Kavanagh, his father, was a teacher. He went to Methodist College and the Queen's University. And he was a local historian, but he was also a truly gifted archivist. And uh, he treasured Ulster customs and speech. And he believed deeply in a progressive regionalism, uh, writing that, quote, meaning and significance should be sought in a limited region with its local history and traditions and special characteristics, unquote. He had a sophisticated sense of the underdog traditions, which often are, are the surface of the hidden history of a people, such as the writing weavers in England about whom he wrote. He, his work uh, becomes far easier to locate once it is seen as reflecting his empathy with dissent. And he was very aware of the moral and aesthetic difficulties of making an, a, a sort of poetic construct out of something as morally ambiguous as colony. But without his attempt, which was a very real part of the ex Irish experience, that colony, without John Hewitt's attempt, the voice of the planter would remain unvoiced. And this immensely important Irish poem, which I, I'm about to read, is part of that attempt to voice that hidden history. It's a complex address to a history which forgave almost nobody. And it registers a loneliness of empire, which is hard on the surface for us, maybe, to sympathize with. But using the Roman metaphor, he builds a strenuous, passionate poem from a dark margin of the Irish imagination. Briefly stated, what I saw in John Hewitt and in this poem was this. Of all the Irish poets I was reading when I was young, he was the one who seemed most firmly rooted in place and yet most dislocated from nation. His poems are rich with details of location and region. He loves to evoke the daily actual rooted and visible. By the time I came to know his work better, I read him as a deeply refreshing commentator 
on Irish poetry, history, and canonicity, a transgressive historian in the Irish context, and never more so than in, in this lovely, interesting poem, The Scar, in which he describes an ancestor of his who went to the window during the famine. In many accounts of, of the famine in Ireland in the regions where it hit hard is of people really, you know, desperate with both hunger and illness coming to the window so that people see them there, these terrible ghosts. Uh, and, and his ancestor went to the window and she gave bread to a famine victim and caught the famine fever and, and died of it. And the poem ends with really a, a wonderful and destabilizing view of race and inheritance. And it interested in me because it suggests a way of acquiring a nation, not through hubris, but through suffering. This is the scar. There's not a chance now that I might recover one syllable of what that sick man said, tapping upon my great-grandmother's shutter and begging, I was told, a piece of bread. For on his tainted breath there hung infection, rank from the cabins of the stricken west, the spores from black potato stalks, the spittle mottled with poison in his rattling chest. But she, who by her nature quickly answered, accepted in return the famine fever. And that chance meeting, that brief confrontation, conscribed me of the Irish dream forever. Though much I cherish lies outside their vision, and much they prize, I have no claim to share. Yet in that woman's death, I found my nation. The old wound aches and shows its fellow scar. Of all the, the, the poets I was reading, it was really Hewitt writing about history or the idea of a nation that requires its sanction, um, that seemed to me the true voice of the dissenter. When he weighs ideas of the exclusions that history can enact, I followed his meaning. The idea that you could be conscribed to a nation, not through hubris, but as I said, through that pain, seemed to me important. Even the word he chooses, an important corrective to the phrase of the indomitable Irishry, one of the truly least useful of Yeats's formulations. Like Kavanagh, you know, Hewitt's an outsider. Neither could write themselves into the narrative of Irish poetry that existed in their time. But they anticipated the demotion of the oracular poet, which has been important to Irish poetry. The formal effect of shifting positions and perceptions is also important. Um, and it constitutes a real pressure on the Irish poem, even if it's not always seen. Ireland, which was a place in my youth of landscapes and distances, has become like so many other places. Uh, with the advent of fracking and global harvesting and corporate interest to be a target for different and very questionable forces. This in turn invites the Irish poet I'm speaking of in this lecture, that migrant between custom and convention and between past and present, to be a sensitive instrument in measuring the seismic change that comes when people lose their natural world, one of the very largest uh, events when I teach at Stanford and I'm teaching the I and the we, I often use the contrast which now exists between the nature poet and the environmentalist poet and the conflict. So that the nature poet, who by the sanction of the poetic tradition can go and look at a mountain, can go and look at moonlight, can see a lake or a river and record their moral illumination from it. The environmentalist poet will come and say, you can't do that unless you also annotate the plunder of these places. That's not a resolvable argument, but it's, it's an interesting one. But in, in, case, in increasingly, I think the Irish nature poem is being transformed by default and by some of these pressures into the political poem, by being pushed there by these arguments uh, about what is being lost 
For so long, the nature poem did register the private imagination. And for so long, it allowed a poet to go to a space and write, as I said, about their own moon, their own landscape, the sunrise as a solitary adventure. But with the passionate rise and advocacy of environmentalism, one of the great moral movements of our day, there is and there will be a powerful call to join the solitary impulses of the traditional nature poem to the public imagination of outrage, and to add to the nature poem the human and societal anger at the threats to the subjects of the nature poem, which is also the planet. The so-called eco-poem, though I'm afraid, does need fresh thinking and rigorous discussion, and it does need a fresh and tough dialogue between private and public. If we're not to have a retreat on the one hand, and a slew of didactic poems on the other. That dialogue can take place, and I do see it happening in this poem, in, in a poem by the Irish poet, Paul Meehan, who was recently the Ireland Professor of Poetry. This poem inhabits an old world of the public imagination, but it infuses it and ventilates it with this private grief that is very interesting. The poem is just about a field in North Dublin, um, in, in what's called Fingal County, and uh, where she lived. Um, and it was zoned for building, as so many green spaces in Dublin were. And that was her home. This is called the death of a field. The field itself is lost. The morning it becomes a sight and the notice goes up. Fingal County Council houses the memory of the field that is lost with the loss of its curves. Though the wood pigeons and the willow and the finches and what's left of the hawthorn hedge and the wagtail and the elder sing on their hungry summer songs, the magpies sound like flying castanets, but the memory of the field disappears with its flora. Who can know the yearning of yarrow for the plight of the scarlet pimpernel whose true color is orange. And the end of the field is the end of the hidey holes where first smokes, first tokes, first gropes, where had the scentless mayweed. The end of the field as we know it is the start of the estate, the site to be planted with houses, each two or three bedrooms, nest of sorrow and chemical, cargo of joy. The end of dandelion is the start of flash, the end of dock is the start of pledge. The end of teasel is the start of aerial. The end of primrose is the start of brillo. The end of thistle is the start of bounce. The end of slow is the start of oxyaction. The end of herb robert is the start of brasso. The end of eyebright is the start of fairy. And who amongst us is able to number the end of grasses, to number the loss of each seeding head? I will walk out once, barefoot under the moon, to know the field through the soles of my feet, and to hear again the myriad leaf flies green and singing, and the million, million cycles of being in wing. That before the field becomes solely a map memory in some archive of some architect's screen, I might possess it or it might possess me. Through its night dew, its moon quite core, its slick and shine, and its profligacy in every wing beat, in every beat of time. I'm going to end this lecture, if I may, following on Paula, who I admire so much, with a poem of my own, which picks up my own restlessness about so many of these issues and my own contentions with some of the Irish tradition. I wrote it some years ago when, like many other poets, I wanted to put a, a note where I certainly had not seen my own name in the Irish poetic tradition. And though, like many others, I had built something of an alternative narrative that went something like this. Ireland's history, this is the narrative I built. I mean, Ireland's history was compelling and it was closely constructed. We Irish born into that ancient sect, wrote Yeats, in one of his most densely woven poems called The Statues. We are, she says, climb to our proper dark, 
It is a wonderful poem, but I was skeptical. I lived a life like so many women around me of dailiness, and I wrote within that. And if I had not written the life I lived in the poem I wrote, I would have been writing someone else's poem. I did not see the proper dark and the shared destiny that Yeats proposed. I made a division, therefore, in Ireland in my own mind between the past and history. I laid aside that official version into which we are invited, but only to make an ascent, uh, an official version of heroes, and I reflected on an Irish past, much less visible, much less easily heard, that was full of whispers and losses, where names were not written. The shifting ground I stood on was partly communal, but it was also deeply private. Uh, the poem I wrote for quarantine was written when the conversation about heroism and history had been somewhat modified in Ireland, but the private space that had been offered to me was more durable. The poem references a story made in a book that's called Michelle Fane. It came out, I think, about 1910 and once was it on every course in, in, in a curriculum in, in Ireland by a man called Antala uh, Pavak uh, O'Leary, who had been a very young boy in the village of Carrick Car Star in West Cork, very badly hit in the Irish famine. Um, and he remembers his mother telling a story of these two very young people, a husband and a wife, who left the workhouse, you know, they were just laboratories of fever, and she was sick with fever. And they left on a, on a freezing night and began to walk back to the cabin where they had lived. But in the morning, uh, they were both weak and they were found dead. Uh, but the woman's feet were held against her husband's chest as if he had tried to warn them uh, as she died. And those people exist for about six sentences. And then they leave all of the air, all of the oxygen, everything that might uh, commemorate them. They become simply the past. And it wasn't, it was their story that partly interested me, but it wasn't only their story that interested me. It was their silence. It was the fact that I lived in a country where their citizenship of the past could also mean their exclusion from history with their names and their titles and their narratives. They become a few sentences, but I followed those sentences to a place where a poem I felt could take root. This lecture has been largely about alternative narratives, about shifting ground and the artistic exclusions that lead to new spaces and new permissions. Occasionally, the shifting ground is an event that touches a poem, or a poem anticipates an event. But just as often, it occurs inside the poet's idiom and the poet's purpose. And we have to, I think, as readers and writers, be ready to enable these shifts in or out of the poem. We have to be vigilant, not about the Irish past, but about the Irish future. We do not have to, as Irish poets, be members of the indomitable Irishry. Many of the people who will come after us as poets are no such thing. And they do not live where the indomitable Irishry lives. They live with their vulnerabilities and their private truths. And we simply have to write out of our own truths and to be vigilant to enable them. Here is the poem I wrote, which reflects on all of that, which drew me also to further reflection. It's called Quarantine. In the worst hour of the worst season, of the worst year, of a whole people, a man set out from the workhouse with his wife. He was walking, they were both walking north. She was sick with famine fever and could not keep up. He lifted her and put her on his back. He walked like that, west and west and north, until at nightfall under freezing stars they arrived. 
In the morning, they were both found dead of cold, of hunger, of the toxins of a whole history. But her feet were held against his breastbone. The last heat of his flesh was his last gift to her. Let no love poem ever come to this threshold. There is no place here for the inexact praise of the easy graces and sensuality of the body. There is only time for this merciless inventory. Their death together in the winter of 1847. Also, what they suffered, how they lived, and what there is between a man and a woman, and in which darkness it can best be proved. Thank you very much.